You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. As you turn there, if you'd notice the first line in this passage, uh, what we read here is that uh, it says, the end of all things is at hand. And uh, what I thought of is that, you know, the, the street preacher with the sign that says, the end is, is near. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I thought about that, I think that street preachers get a bad rap. Um, for good reason for some, but I think everyone gets painted with the same brush. Um, we know that there are those with the signs and saying, turn or burn, and you're not really sure if they want you to burn or turn. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of burning, but not a whole lot of gospel in what they preach. Um, and so there, there is the understanding of why there is a, uh, a bad taste in people's mouth or a bad idea when it comes to street preaching. But good street preaching is a good thing. God has used that uh, throughout uh, the centuries. Now, you think of guys like George Whitfield and what they've done in the open air in preaching the gospel uh, in public like that. And, um, you know, as we, we think about this, and we think about the, the revivals uh, that happened, and, and those great revivals throughout history did not take place apart from the preaching of the word. Uh, and, and very often uh, was in the open air preaching uh, that God has used for those things. And, it, you know, as you look at church history and you look at uh, where we come to today and, and um, where the church is at and, and bringing people in and what they talk about with revival and they talk about with church growth, uh, very often it's, it's looking at, okay, what, what, what do the people want to see in church and how do we bring them in? That, and, and listen, I, I think often there's good intentions with this. You know, how can we share with them God's word, but we got to get them in. And so we, we go and we, we do the things that we think will attract them in and and things that we think will get them into the seats. You know, sometimes we go into the community and we poll the community and say, what, what would you like to see in church? What would make you come to church? Um, and the problem with that is then that we make church then all about them. And so they come and they learn, well, church is all about me. It's, it's, it's about my preferences and what I want. Uh, and so then they come to learn, well, the Christian life then is all about me. Uh, and there's this man-centeredness in it all. Uh, but that's not the Christian life at all. It's not about me, what I'm looking for, what makes me feel good, um, but really it's about me living uh, to serve others, and even in that, serving others to the glory of God. That in everything I do, it's all for God. It's all about Him. What, is, what does God desire? What does He want to see? What pleases Him in everything we say and do? And even as we gather together as a church, and we, we interact together, and we grow together, we, we serve each other and love each other, we do all of that even for the glory of God. It's all for Him in what we do and honoring Him in our lives. And so as we come to our text here for this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4, I think we see what the Christian life is. That it's not me seeking my own preferences and desires, but it's about sacrifice, about service, about uh, loving others to the glory of God. And we see how Peter lays these things out here. So as we come to our text here, uh, we come to the end of uh, what I have argued is the larger section that began back in chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. There we read, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, you can say aliens and strangers, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so even what we go through here this morning, we see what it looks like to live as aliens and strangers in this world. Now, we don't live like the world lives. We don't pursue the things the world pursues. Uh, now we look different from the world. We don't live as if this world is our home, because it's not. And we live 
our lives keeping our conduct honorable among unbelievers in the hopes that God may save some. As we've been going through this, we saw last week in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4, how since Christians, when they suffer for righteousness, they, they can know that they are blessed because Christ suffered and was victorious, and he has won the victory for all who trust in him. And so when Christians suffer for righteousness, uh, they can know that they will follow the pattern that Christ has set, that, that suffering gives way to victory, that suffering gives way to glory. We see that because Christ suffered, died, and was risen to glory, right? He rose again and throned over angels, powers, and authorities. And since Christ won the victory, the suffering follower of Christ can be certain that Christ will bring to them the victory. And so we saw Peter then conclude from that, that since that is the case, Christians should be willing to suffer. And therefore, we went over last week, as Peter told his readers to arm themselves with the same attitude that was in Christ, the attitude that was uh, that of determination to do God's will, even if it means suffering, even if it means dying. And if a Christian gives themselves to suffering in order to live for God's will, then it shows that they are ready to do whatever it takes to live for God's will, including pursuing holiness, including putting off sin in their lives. And when a Christian arms themselves with this attitude that was in Christ, they can also follow Christ's example and entrust themselves to the one who judges justly. And since all will stand before God in judgment one day, they can trust that God will make every wrong right. And since everyone, again, will stand in judgment one day, Peter says that's, that's why the gospel was preached to those who are dead. And, and I argue that that is referring to those who, when they were alive, the gospel was preached to them and they believed. And, but since it came to the time when Peter was writing, since then they had died and likely even died uh, from being persecuted, died a martyr's death. And so he said that though they were judged in the flesh according to man's standards, they live in the Spirit, in God's presence, which is the great hope of everyone trusting in Christ, that we are going to be with our God and be with him forever. And so in light of these things, Peter calls his readers to live. In light of the fact that our, our great hope is being with our God, and in light of the fact that the day is coming when in God's judgment he will make everything right, we are to live in response to that. And, and so that brings us to our text here for this morning. And so let's, let's look to our text and read together, again, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be glory, to him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so, again, the first thing we see here in this passage there in verse 7 is when Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. And the word at hand, uh, it can mean to draw near or, or approach. And the Greek verb is in the perfect tense, uh, which can indicate a process. And so the approaching of the end of all things. And this likely refers to the judgment uh, where every wrong is made right, which Peter left off talking about last time as we went over last week. And I would argue that Peter can say this because Peter, as us, are in the last days. Uh, the final age, uh, before the judgment, before the judgment day that leads up to Christ's return. And that last age is the church age that was kicked off in Christ's death and resurrection and marked by the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so in light of the fact that the events of the end are approaching and are therefore imminent, 
Uh, Since the end is drawing near, Peter commands his readers to be self-controlled and sober-minded. These two words are almost synonymous with each other. Uh, Here is the idea of being clear-minded and self-controlled. When we are clear-minded, we see ourselves and we see others. Uh, We see our sin and the sins of others. We we see the world around us uh, for what it is. Uh, We see things through the, the lens of Scripture. So again, saying being self-controlled or or clear-minded, or you could say having sound judgment. And this carries the idea of being under control. And and, and so when it comes to our minds, just not letting our minds run every which way and and thinking all kinds of things, uh, but focusing in our thoughts on what is true and what is right. And the next word is the word for being sober. Again, to have self-control, to have a clear mind as opposed to being intoxicated, uh, where your mind is anything but clear, where you have anything but control and your inhibitions are, are lowered, that you may do foolish things and have bad judgment. And so in light of, of living in the last age, with everything moving towards the end that God has established for his judgment, Peter calls his readers to be clear-minded and self-controlled. And he calls them to this for their prayers, for the sake of their prayers. In light of the end drawing near, believers should be focused in prayer. Prayer is so vital to our lives. So vital, Charles Spurgeon compared praying for the Christian to breathing. How long are you going to go without breathing before you realize you're running into some trouble? How long do we go without praying? until we realize we're, we're running into some trouble. Praying is vital to us. Prayer is the expression of our dependency upon God and, and the recognition of his sovereignty over everything. When we come to God with our concerns, when we come to God laying our requests before him, we are recognizing that he's the only one that can really do anything in our situation, that he is the one who is sovereign, that nothing comes to pass apart from his ordaining of it. Prayer, too, is also then an expression of our surrender to his sovereignty. That as we look to God and, again, make our requests, we don't look to God just so that, you know, as one person put it, that we're not trying to bend God's will to us, but we're we're being conformed to his will in prayer. And so for how vital prayer is, we should always be striving for a prayer life that is full of persistency and and, and without distraction. To not let the cares and the concerns of life or or the lusts of the flesh distract us from the time that we need to be in prayer. And that too, that those things would not also distract us from being in the Word. Because even in prayer, we can miss out on the spiritual resources that are ours in prayer when we're ignorant of what the Scriptures teach us. Now, when we pray, we don't come asking of the things that are of God's will as he's revealed in his word and seeking what God has supplied for us and what God has for us. And so all of this takes focus and discipline. It takes being clear-minded and self-controlled. And this is always a fight in our lives, is it not? I admit... uh, Too often, the things that I'm struggling with, the things that worry me, the things that frustrate me, the things that hurt me, upset me, uh, too easily sneak into my thoughts uh, and distract me and take up the time that I had set aside for prayer. Uh, and, And yet, I find myself often focusing on other things. And this is a constant battle. It's kind of comforting, though, to understand that it's a constant battle for everyone. Uh, The one book that some of us, the men in the church, read together, The Disciplines of a Godly Man, I remember reading in that book, and uh, when he talked about his struggle uh, in prayer and uh, not being distracted in his times of prayer, I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) Feel better when I'm not alone in this, uh, to know that others struggle with that as well. Maybe I'm not doing as bad as I, I think I am. But... Nonetheless, though, prayer 
is called for to be a, a consistent thing, an intentional thing. And just because it's, it's a constant battle for us, and just because it's a constant battle for all of us, doesn't mean it's not a battle worth fighting. And it certainly is. It doesn't mean that we don't strive for growth in this area. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking for growth and expecting growth, because we certainly, certainly should be expecting to grow in this. Grow in our, our prayers. Grow in our focus and our discipline as we seek God in our lives. There should certainly be growth. Like anything else. Like when Peter commands his readers to be holy as God is holy. And as we take that command and apply it to ourselves, we've got to recognize we're, we're never really going to be as holy as God is in this life. And yet that doesn't mean we don't strive for it. And both in holiness and in prayer, which I think those things go together. I mean, we talked about already going through First Peter how when there's unrepentant sin in our lives, that can hinder our prayers. And if we're going to strive to be holy as God is holy, we certainly need to be praying. We certainly need to be depending on God then in our lives. And so these things do go together. But as we strive for these things, we strive for the highest standard, the standard that God himself has set, because we're striving to please God. We're saying, well, everyone struggles. No one's there yet. So, you know, I put effort into it. So I'm, I'm good. I've, I've tried. I've, and we are satisfied with where we're at. That's not what the scriptures call us to. Being satisfied with where we're at is, is, is living for ourselves. Saying, I'm good. I'm comfortable here. But it's not about our comfort. If we really know this God and we really know the gospel, we want to know what he's done for us through Jesus Christ, if we truly love him as we see his love for us, do we not want to love him and pleasing him in our lives? And so even though we have not yet reached that standard, and, and again, this side of eternity, we won't, are we not still striving because we're saying, listen, I want to please you in everything. I want to grow in this area because I want my life to be all about you because you're worthy of my life being all about you. And so we should strive for growth. We should expect there to be growth as we depend upon God in these things and we rely on the work of his spirit in us, growing us in this. As we grow in hating our sin more and more, and we strive to know him because there's nothing greater than knowing him, nothing greater than living for him, him who's our reward, right? As we said last week, what's the great hope that we have that when this life on this earth is all said and done, we're going to go be with him and be with him forever. That's our great hope. There's nothing greater than that. No one greater than that. And so how could there be anything worth living for more than him, worth striving for than to strive to please him in all that we do. He's worthy of the struggle. He's worthy of the battle. He's worthy of us expecting growth and seeing growth in our lives, all for his glory. And whatever is accomplished in our life, whatever growth there is, he gets all the glory. It's what he has done. If we don't grow, if we, if we fail, that, that's on us. That's, 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 we haven't taken up our responsibility. But whatever growth forward, whatever victory there is, we give him all the praise because he has done the work in us. And again, again yet he gives us responsibility. And we need to take up that responsibility to grow in our prayer life, to grow in holiness. And as we do so, I mean, as we strive for these things, this is really the, the evidence of our salvation, the evidence of, of the work of the Spirit in us as we desire these things. It's the evidence that we recognize this world is not our home. We don't live like those in this world. We are aliens and strangers in this world. And then as believers are called here by Peter to live in light of the, the imminence of, of the end of, of final judgment, we understand that love must undergird all that we do. 
And so we see here in verse 8, Peter tells his readers, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Back in chapter 1, verse 22, we saw Peter call for a, a brotherly or a family love for one another. And, and just like in that passage, we see here, he, he calls for there to be an earnest love for one another. And there we discussed that, you know, saying earnestly love one another, that earnest that could be translated as a, the idea of passion or fervent, or it could also be the idea of persistent love. I still haven't decided where exactly I fall on that. Uh, but again, there's truth to both. Both are, are true. And whether it's a passionate and fervent love or a persistent love, uh, Peter's calling for his readers to maintain that love among one another, right? Keep loving one another earnestly. And why does he have to call his readers to maintain this love? Well, um, well, let's think about ourselves. Uh, how often can we look at our lives and say, I've made it, I'm good. I've done nothing wrong here. <laughs> we can't very often, right? Again, we're commanded to be holy. And why does he have to command to be holy? Because we're not, <laughs> right? That's why he has to command it. So we strive for that holiness, but we're not holy yet. We are holy in his sight, credited with the righteousness and holiness of God by faith, but in our outliving, we're not yet holy. In our outliving, we still struggle with sin, we, we still fall to temptation, right? And the chances are, at some point, at least, I'm, I'm going to sin against you. And at some point, you're going to sin against me. And whoever sins against the other, we may even respond to the one sinfulness sinfully. And the natural response to that would be to let love grow cold. Because otherwise we have to work at it, right? We have to work at maintaining our relationship with one another. We have to work at maintaining love that is passionate, love that is fervent, love that is persistent. And that is work. And so Peter commands them that we are to keep loving one another. And the word earnest here can have the idea of, of intensity. It's the, the idea of, of muscles remaining tense. And so can we maintain such an intensity in love for one another? Or do we let our love become laxed? And what's the reason Peter calls for maintaining such a love? Well, he says, since love covers a multitude of sins. It would seem Peter gets this from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, which says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Love does not delight in exposing faults. Love does not seek revenge. But love delights in forgiveness. If our love for one another lacks such intensity that everyone needs to be just the way I want them to be, that there can be no ill feelings ever, or no one can ever do me any wrong, or there can be never any misunderstanding if I'm going to give myself to them and serve them, if I'm unwilling to look even, overlook even a small offense and, and believe the best about my brother or sister in Christ, or even not the small offenses, what happens when there is a larger offense or when there is persistent sin? Sin that needs to be confronted. Do we have such intensity of love and maintain this love that when it's necessary... We will forgive our brothers and sisters, even of greater offenses, and allow for there to be reconciliation when there's repentance. I mean, as I think about it, again, I'm bound to sin against you at some point, right? And if I recognize, yeah, I, I blew it, I, I sinned, aren't I going to want that love from you 
that's willing to forgive me and come alongside of me? And aren't you going to want that from someone else that you've sinned against? And so should we not be sharing that love and showing that love to each other? How did God love us? Did God forgive our sin or or does he continue to hold it against us? Uh, Did God cast our sin into a sea of forgetfulness or is he still tallying up the score? Now we know how he loved us in sending Jesus Christ. Christ who came and bore the cost of our sin on himself in our place on the cross. And then if any of us should fail to forgive the offenses uh, between each other here, I mean, are, are, are anything, we, I forget where we, maybe it was in when, or Tuesday night in the men's study. And they were talking about that. We're never going to forgive as much of each other as God has forgiven against us. And yet we, we can't forgive each other. We can't love each other. We can't main, strive to maintain such earnest love between each other, that love would cover a multitude of sins? I mean, are we not brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we not of the family of God together? Then we should maintain this love earnestly and let love cover a multitude of sins. And then Peter continues to call for love in light of of the imminence uh, of the end of all things. In verse 9, he says, show hospitality to one another. And the Greek word for hospitality literally is to love strangers. Now, often we think of hospitality as in, you know, we, we welcome someone into our home and, and bring them over for dinner, which, don't get me wrong, is a great way to express hospitality, but the word is more than that. And I, I think as we see in this context, that the word would be referring to loving someone despite anything about them. That we give of ourselves to serve and uh, to do what we can to provide, uh, to look for the best interest of the other person and to meet genuine needs. And we see here again, Peter says uh, that they are to love each other this way. Be hospitable to one another. And it seems then that the context is is still how they treat each other within their local church. Uh, But certainly this would apply to to any Christian that would be uh, treated as a brother or sister in Christ. Showing love to those who who are in need. And so we think of the context, too, that these were believers who were suffering for their faith. They They were undergoing persecution. And so loving them in such a way... Uh, could bring risk upon oneself who is showing such hospitality. If one opened their home, for instance, uh, someone who opened their home to their church so that church could have a place to meet, uh, that could make them a target of persecution. Uh, Maybe they were kind of under the radar for a while, but now the church is meeting at their home. There is risk to that, that they would be taking on themselves and being hospitable. And so being hospitable, especially as we look in that time, would be a call for sacrifice, for risk. There would be a cost for sure. Again, making yourself a target. But sacrificing your time, sacrificing of your resources in order to love a fellow brother or sister in Christ. And yet, how does Peter call for this to be done? Without grumbling. How much do we do without grumbling? (laughs) Maybe we don't want to answer that question. (laughs) You know, and think of it this way. Maybe one opens their home to a member of their church that has been ostracized from their family because they're a follower of Christ. And we've discussed before that, you know, it was hard to live on your own if you didn't have a way to provide for yourself. It was difficult, so much so that some people gave themselves into slavery because they were better off as a slave than they were trying to make it on their own. And so this fellow believer now finds themselves out on their own, kicked out of their home because they follow Christ. And so this member of their church brings them into their home, and at first it's a great idea. This is great but they didn't realize how long-term it would be. 
And after a while, they missed the freedom that they had before a non-blood relative moved in. And then that person starts to be Come annoying to them, not because that person really is annoying, but just because they're tired of being inconvenienced. They still show hospitality, but it's not without grumbling. Peter says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Don't be tempted to resent your good deed. Are we ever tempted to resent our good deeds and what we're doing? And so grumble? (laughs) I think we have to admit sometimes it's even before we do any good deeds. Sometimes when it's just the request is made, we start to grumble. Really? You're really going to ask me to do that right now? (sighs) I mean, things are just so crazy at the moment. I just got so much going on. I just, honestly. And this is not something I am guilt-free of myself. Uh, And even as I I think in the specific ones that are in my head of the times that I had opportunity to love someone else, and I certainly grumbled. Um, You know, I I think about that, and and why did I grumble? As well, I'm I'm busy. I got all this going on. There's, you know, this is just not a good week. And as I think about those specific times that are in my head, really, why was I so busy? Why was it about? Well, what it came down to is really I, I I didn't manage my time well. And so I had all these things I had to rush and get done, but if I had you know, kept on top of my schedule and did things when I should have done them, then I would have been more free to rearrange things or, or had some open time that it would have been so much easier to help and to serve. And so really, I think a big part of this in keeping ourselves from grumbling is being disciplined. That in everything we do, we're thinking about what's in the best interest of the other, even in my scheduling even in being disciplined and being on top of things, so that when something is inserted to my schedule that I wasn't ready for, I wasn't prepared, I, I'm, I'm able to take it on and not be tempted to grumble. And really, not even just not grumbling, but hopefully then be able to take it on with joy, that I have an opportunity here to serve my brother or sister in Christ. And that's really what our attitude should be. Joyously loving each other, joyously serving one another. So I think there's things that we can do to help ourselves. I mean, the scriptures call us to live disciplined lives, is it not? The scripture calls us uh, to be thinking about how what we do affects others. And I, and I think that comes down to even such details as our schedule. And what can we do um, to be more disciplined and be more available to each other? I think mean, it's important that we could serve each other with joy rather than with grumbling. And then Peter continues on with the idea of showing love to others as he goes from talking about hospitality to the empowering of God for each one in the church to do their part. So we see there in verse 10, he says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And Peter, again, writing to these churches in Asia Minor, writing to them, these members of the church, that God has empowered the members of the church to serve and to meet the needs of the church. we've discussed before, each one in the church has a part to play. They are to do their part. Each one is to be serving and using the gifts that God has given to them to serve. Uh, The Greek word here for gift, uh, the root word, is, is the word for grace. And the only other time this word is used in the New Testament is when the Apostle Paul uses it to speak of the same things, this uh, empowerment, uh, these abilities given by God's power in the Holy Spirit, given to serve. And these gifts are a manifestation of God's grace. They're not something that we have earned, but something that God has kindly empowered us with. And so no one has, again, earned these gifts, which means that no one has earned their place to serve in the church. We serve as a privilege that God has given us by his grace and kindness. We have no right, really, to serve in of ourselves. The only thing we deserve is to go to hell. And yet we have an opportunity to serve our God in his church, among his people, and that we will be serving our God, our king, forever in his kingdom. 
I mean, that's the privilege that we have before us. And so that means no matter what the task is, no matter what we are doing and how we are serving, we serve according to the grace that God has given. You know, there are some tasks and, and some ways of serving that are not glamorous and, and that are behind the scenes and that people may not even necessarily ever know about. But can we, do we look at those things and be like, no, nah, that's not for me. I'm, I'm above that. It's not for me to do. I don't think we understand what we're talking about here, if that's our attitude with whatever the task may be. Whenever we are being used by God to build up the body, to edify each other, to do the ministry for God's glory, we are doing a task that is granted to us only by His grace. And the only reason we have the grace to do it is because of what Christ has done, that we would receive God's grace. That Christ took on himself what we deserve so that we can know the grace of God in our lives. That Christ suffered for us and rose again, who believe. And that we can now then live for God and serve God in all that we do in serving him in serving one another. We see God has given different categories of, of gifts and, and the different strengthings and shades of ability that he brings together in his church and, and using these things to equip his church to serve and meet the needs through the members of the church. And so exercising your gifts and serving in the church is not an option. Peter says we are to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And the word varied there is, uh, can be the idea of, of many different colors. And therefore, as you have been gifted by God's grace, you are a steward. You have responsibility. You've been gifted by your king for a task. And so what is that task? Each one has at least one gift. What, are your, what is your gift or your gifts? Uh, we've discussed before about the idea of saying, okay, what, what are my gifts? How am I to serve? What am I to be doing? Um, and I'm not going to take the time right now to get into that. We are going to talk about that a bit as we, we get further along in Sunday school with the things we're talking about there. Um, but if you are asking, listen, I don't, I don't know what my gift is. I don't know how I'm to be serving, how I fit in. Listen, let's, let's sit down and talk. All right, well, let's, let's sit down and go over these things uh, and, and see how you can be uh, serving in the church as, as God has put you here, not by mistake, by his sovereignty, has put you here uh, to serve his body, to serve and be part of the edification of the body, that each one grows up into the head that is Christ as we grow in Christ's likeness together. You are here, part of North Valley Baptist Church, for a reason and a purpose. And so let's, let's get together if you're unsure how you fit in, and let's, let's work that out. Again, you are a steward of what gifts God has given you. You have responsibility. Serving is an act of obedience. Again, one of the purposes we have been placed here is for serving. And again, we have to recognize it's for serving one another. Uh, God has not empowered me and, and given me an ability so I can serve myself with that ability. So I can say, hey, look what I can do, or look what I've done, and, and pat myself on the back for it. But it's, it's for others. It's for serving others within the church. I, I like what uh, Thomas Schreiner says in his commentary. He says, gifts are not given so that believers can congratulate themselves on their abilities. They are bestowed to serve others. The point is that spiritual gifts are given to serve and to help others, to strengthen others in the faith. They are bestowed for ministry, not to enhance self-esteem. Paul emphasizes the same theme, reminding believers that gifts are given to build up and edify others in the faith. And he's right. These are the reasons God has given us these gifts in serving others and building up others and edifying uh, the members of the church. 
And in verse 11, Peter gives two examples of how gifts are to be used. And it begins with speaking. And whether that is preaching and teaching the word of God, or, or whether that is in evangelism and sharing the gospel with the lost, they are to speak as one who speaks oracles or sayings of God. And so speaking not with their own wisdom or, or just what their own opinion is or getting up on their own soapboxes, but speaking that which is the revealed truth of God from his authoritative word. It is by the wisdom of God, by what God has made known about himself, that we can build up the church and edify one another. Again, not by man's tactics, not by assumptions, but by the word of God. And so those who do serve in this way through speaking, they serve by the gift God has given them by his grace, and so serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And that's true of those who not speak but serve in other ways, whether in prayer or, or showing mercy or, or doing different tasks and meeting needs and, and, and serving in, in all the different areas uh, where there is need within the church. And just as one doesn't speak from their own mind or their own opinion, so to the one who serves does not serve in their own strength, but they serve by the strength that God supplies. And the one who speaks is not to speak their own wisdom and opinion, and the one who serves is not to serve in their own strength because their speaking and their serving is not about them. If it was their own opinion, if it wasn't their own wisdom, they can pat themselves on the back and say, look how good I did. Or the one who serves in their own strength and say, hey, look how strong I am to serve and do this and that. Look at me. But it's not about them. Again, the gifts are not for us in building ourselves up and, and, and making ourselves puffed up. But we have these gifts to serve others, but even then, in serving others, it's not about the others that we serve. To what end do we serve others? To the glory of God. Right? That's, that's really what it's all about. Peter says here that we serve for the glory of God. It's all about God. Everything we do here together. It's all for his glory, and he's worthy of it being all about him. He is worthy of receiving the glory. He's the one that does the work anyway. It's in the strength that he supplies. What's spoken is to be spoken of the truth of his word. He gets all the glory. He gets all the credit. The work is done by his grace, through his empowering, through his spirit. And all glory belongs to God. And Peter says here, it belongs to him through Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ, because it's what his redemptive work has done that, that makes all of this possible. Again, we are only empowered by God to serve for God's glory because we have been bought, brought into a right relationship with God through the work of Christ on the cross. And because of Christ, we serve to the glory of God. Because of this gospel, we find motivation to continue to serve and maintain love among us and, and, and show hospitality and to use our gifts. We find the motivation because we realize we're doing it for him. Him who so loved us, how do we not love him in return? Him who is so great and glorious, he's worthy of us doing it all for him. We find the motivation here. The believer's whole life is to be for God in all that we say and do. And so then thinking on this, Peter then is led to give praise to God. And he says, to him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Some debate here. Uh, is Peter saying to God belongs glory and dominion forever and ever? Or is he saying to Jesus belongs glory and dominion forever and ever? Some argue that it being ambiguous, we should just leave it that way. Uh, because really both are true, right? They are both equally God, and so glory belongs to them equally, and dominion to them equally, forever and ever. Amen. And our God will receive the glory that is due to him. And one day he will return to put down any and all opposition to his glory. 
And those who hate him and so hate his people, they will stand before him and he will make every wrong right. The end of all things is drawing near. The day is imminent. And so, my friends, are you living in light of that coming day? Are you living in light of that truth? Are you living in full dependency on God in prayer and so being self-controlled and sober-minded? Does love undergird all that you do? Are you maintaining fervent or consistent love for one another and showing hospitality? Are you exercising your gifts within the church to serve one another? And are you doing it all to the glory of God through Jesus Christ? Living your whole life for your creator who made you for himself. And when we live like this, when we live with love undergirding all things, as we depend upon God in everything, as we maintain such love among us, forgiving each other, lifting each other up, as we serve each other, we live as aliens and strangers in this world. We live lives that show that this world is not our home. And to a outside world looking in, we keep our conduct before unbelievers as honorable in the hope that God would save some. All right, what does Jesus say about our love for one another? By this, they'll know that you are my disciples. Now, we show that we truly belong to Jesus and we are truly following him. We show the power and the truth of the gospel in our lives as we serve each other to the glory of our God. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nbbc.com.